Welcome back to the channel and our little repair community. In the last video, I introduced the topic, the consumer goods dilemma. And it involved chairs like this one that I happened to see just the other day. And it is a dilemma and it's going to require several more videos before we finish discussing the breadth of this subject. But I didn't want all the negative connotation videos being all in order. So let's jump in here with something positive, something you can use in the workplace on a day to day basis. And that has to do with restoring or refinishing the surface of degraded plastics. Let's get to work. course we're going to start out with some degreaser and customarily if I don't want degreaser everywhere I will spray it on the scuff pad keep it more localized and I have a paper towel at the ready now it's good to reference a published source when we describe to our customer what's happening here with the plastic Exposure to ultraviolet radiation may cause significant degradation of many materials. UV radiation causes photo-oxidative degradation, which results in breaking of the polymer chains, causing deterioration of mechanical properties and leading to useless materials after an unpredictable time. So then, for many plastics, this oxidation could be expected. Usually for plastics, I will follow up with a prep of alcohol and then acetone. Now you can see we're working on a convertible. And it's interesting that our source adds this more specific information. The photo degradation is degradation of a photo degradable molecule caused by the absorption of photons, particularly those wavelengths found in sunlight such as infrared radiation, visible light, and ultraviolet light. Well, no wonder then that the plastics in a convertible would be more apt to degrade from the sunlight. So that is very informative material. Thank you for that. Now, in a previous video, we showed how we could use heat to melt the surface plastic, especially that that we had just sanded, in this case, polypropylene, where we had fibers of polypropylene that would melt quite readily with a flash heat. So we're doing the same thing here, only we're going to do the entire panel. As long as the plastic is a thermoplastic like we have here with the polypropylene, then we can remelt the surface. The idea here is to use your highest setting on the heat gun and spend as little time on the surface as you can, as is necessary to remelt. In other words, we want to remelt just the surface, not throughout the entire piece. We don't want to risk warping the piece, right? Just melt the surface as quickly as possible. So we're going to call this painting with heat. And that is in real time, but we're going to speed up through the rest of the piece. And you can tell right away that this will be a significant advantage to us in recoloring this panel. We've got a head start on the color just by melting or painting with the heat. Of course, for many of you technicians, this is an old idea you've known about for years, but uh, you can appreciate that this is one chapter that we have to include in our reference manual here. And we want to avoid melting the weather stripping.
One reason it's difficult to shoot videos on site is the fact that we get interrupted ten times, uh, this time by a customer that brought by the sofa cushion for me to repair, so that's for another day. Here I'm also prepping the adjacent panel with some acetone so that our masking tape will stick down well. The situation I was facing here is the building was blocking the sun, this is earlier in the morning, and our plastic looked a total different color in the shade than in the, in the sun. It looked like it was in a totally different family. It looks like it's a, a medium to dark gray in the shade, but in the sun you can see it's a tan color. What a difference. Whenever my customers want to offer me a place inside, they end up saying, oh yeah, I know, I know, you always like to work in the sun. <laughs> now you know why. <laughs> So of course I'm testing my color out here where the sun is shining. Now here I'm using the plastic primer as a base for my pigments. Uh, bear in mind that the plastic primer, and you'll see this uh, around the cap, is very brittle when it dries. If it's going to be too brittle, we could run into a problem. So instead of using the plastic primer directly, uh, you might opt to put a little bit of the leather base in with it to give it some more flexible properties. Or perhaps add some of flex additive to the plastic primer. If all of that is too shiny, and plastic primer is shiny by default, you can always adjust that. So it depends on uh, what your target color and the target sheen is. You can always add a little flattener if you need to. And this is such a durable product, I don't usually concern myself with putting a clear over the top. And we're gonna add one more blending coat. Of course, for every pass that I make on this panel, I'm also doing the same thing on the other panel on the other side of the vehicle. I usually mask off the seat belt here. I don't know why I didn't in this case, which means I have to go back and clean it later. As you know, especially with aircraft, we want to mask off the seat belt so we don't have any problem later on. So that's it. We've got to remove our masking tape and do a little cleanup and that'll be the finish of this job. And speaking about our consumer goods dilemma, this is what the upholstery shop faced. And this is their answer. And that will set the stage for future videos. Sometimes you just have to be creative and do something. In this case, a piece of carpet. That's it for the video for today. Very short, but informative, I hope. And uh, I'd like to conclude with something musical since many of our technicians are also very creative. Uh, interestingly, I had a friend go out of state and get married and he came back and told me that he used my music for his wedding. That's the second time that's happened and I just cannot believe it. Of all the songs that you could pick, all the romantic songs that are out there to feature for your wedding. And uh, he chose mine. It's just mind-boggling. But uh, wow. <laughs> I got invited to uh, a friend's house. He's an audiophile. And he's got a listening room also uh, for showing uh, movies. So he invited me over there to bring my CDs and, and see how they sounded on his system. 
And it was eye-opening, or ear-opening, if you will. <laughs> and because I was not mixing with a subwoofer, I was missing some of that low-end content. And on a couple of songs, the low end was a bit muddy. And nobody likes a muddy bottom. So that was convincing enough for me to know that I needed to add a subwoofer to my studio. And the system that was powerful enough for my small room, and yet uh, wouldn't break the budget, was this Atom Audio. Now the reference monitors were a little bit smaller than the Tannoy's that I was using, but that's okay because the subwoofer makes up for the difference. Still I can use these highly regarded Tannoy's for comparison. Now the new monitors give me a much greater frequency range. The Tannoy frequency response, as you can see, went from 47 hertz up to 20 kilohertz. Whereas the Atom reference monitors extend even lower, and that's strange because it's a smaller cone, but it extends lower from 39 hertz and all the way higher to 25 kilohertz. And as you can see, the sub handles everything between 28 hertz and 120 hertz. So hopefully now my mixes will have greater clarity and they'll have a more solid, punchy low end. And I'll leave you with this picture of some new strings on the wound strings, one twist. For the nylon strings, two twists. And I weave the ends underneath the next string to hold it tight. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.